Hey there students! In this segment, I'm going to talk to you about the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. If you've been watching my French Revolution series, which hopefully you have been, then we've been through the French Revolution of 1789. We've gone over the old regime. We've looked at the failed meeting of the Estates General. We've looked at some of the activities of the National Assembly. Uh, but I didn't talk in detail about the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which is a major document uh, having to do with the French Revolution. And I think that uh, this document really has a lot to say about both what the French revolutionaries were looking for in 1789 and it kind of foreshadows in a way where the revolution is going to go. Thank you, Kristen, for just asking for this video at just the right time, uh, right after I'd kind of figured out just how I want to teach it. And uh, let's go ahead and go into it. The Declaration of the Rights of Man the Citizen was passed by the National Assembly on August 26, 1789. And this really laid out a, well, I mean, what it was, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. We're taking France, which had been an absolute monarchy, and for the first time, we are outlining a plan for constitutional government and principles of constitutional government based on the natural rights of man. And for people not just being subjects of a king, but citizens of a nation. Now, in order in order to understand this, I think that you really have to look at the influencers, like who is really influencing the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Now first, I'm going to call your attention to Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was the author of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, very much a crusader for liberty, and also at the time, the U.S. ambassador to France. So he would have been in contact with some of the people who were writing this document. But we also have to take into account the Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a Frenchman. Now, while Jefferson was a classical liberal and in all cases really a champion of individual rights and seeing government more than anything as, you know, kind of like this, this Lockean construct of protecting natural rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, while Jefferson is a classical liberal and we're going to get that voice, uh, you know, this classical liberal uh, emphasis on the individual, Rousseau is going to place some emphasis on not only individualism, but also what I may refer to as radical democracy uh, that is focused on government as an instrument of the general will. So what we're going to see here in the Declaration of the Rights of Man the Citizen is kind of a dialogue between Jefferson, the champion of individual rights, and Rousseau, who in a lot of ways symbolizes the general will and that form of government as far as an upholder of majority rule. Now, some people refer to Rousseau as a sort of proto-socialist. Now, people who are really familiar with Rousseau say that this is based on a very simplistic reading of Rousseau, that people who say this don't really understand Rousseau. But then you would ask yourself, what about the people writing this document? Were they necessarily big-time Rousseau scholars, or were they people who had a casual interest and picked and chose what was best uh, for them and what fit into their program? And I think you're going to look at the latter. So at this point, let's go ahead and look at the document and let's see when we see Jeffersonian uh, individualism and liberalism and then when are we going to see Rousseau's emphasis on democracy and the general will. And you've got to keep in mind these two aren't always going to play well together because although we technically, typically in our society we think of democracy as being synonymous with freedom, it really is not. I mean, just ask Socrates, like, hey, Socrates is annoying. The majority approves. Well, I was about to do this, but really more like this. Okay, Socrates, you are about to literally drink yourself to death. So just keep that in mind, this tension between the individualism of Jefferson and this more kind of uh, proto-socialist uh, sort of mentality that you're going to see creep in here now and then. All right now, here we go. We've got the Declaration of the Rights of Man the Citizen pulled up on my website, tomritchie.net, if you ever want to take a look at it for yourself. And it begins with a preamble, as most documents do. 
The representatives of the French people organized a national assembly considering that ignorance, forgetfulness, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole causes of public miseries and the corruption of governments have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man, so that this declaration, being ever present to all members of the social body, may unceasingly remind them of their rights and duties. Now, you see here, first of all, you see Jefferson, okay, that uh, when we forget about the rights of man, all kinds of misery starts. But then we also saw some things about members of the social body. And we not only saw rights, uh, which this is the language of Jefferson, but also something that uh, we don't see as much in uh, American documents, the duties, okay? So the rights of citizenship and the duties of citizenship. In consequence, the National Assembly recognizes and declares in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and citizen. Notice the invocation of the Supreme Being. We see the language of deism, much like we see in the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Not uh, necessarily the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, anything like that, but the Supreme Being. Uh, this is civic deism, as we see in a lot of Western societies today. First off, men are born free and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions can be based only on public utility. Now keep in mind this is kind of a play on Rousseau whose book The Social Contract begins with the sentence man is born free but everywhere he is in chains. So these people are taking a step further. Men are born free and remain free and equal in rights that perhaps we can set up the type of social contract that will guarantee freedom. And then when we see that social distinctions can be based only on public utility we see that in societies such as uh, the United States or in any other society where you have leaders, uh, if the President of the United States comes into the room, uh, you would show respect. You would refer to him as Mr. President. He has a title. There's all kinds of pomp and circumstance that surrounds the President. Not necessarily because the circumstances of his birth or anything like that, that he had a title of nobility or any of the like, but because he holds an office that we deem to be important. And he got that office because he was elected by a majority of the people. So we do have social distinctions in modern free societies, but they are not due to hereditary nobility. They are there because they benefit the public. Two, the aim of every political association is the preservation of the natural and inalienable rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Now, of course, we see some Jeffersonian language here. Three, the source of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body, no individual can exercise authority that does not proceed from it in plain terms. Now, you see here that we see a reference to the nation, which is part of the whole idea of the French Revolution, turning France from estates into one single nation. No first estate, no second estate, no third estate, no hereditary nobility, protection for the church, anything like that, but a full nation. Now, you keep in mind, too, that sovereignty resides in the nation, which is kind of more of a Rousseau kind of construct than Jeffersonian. If we think of sovereignty in the United States and where that resides, we would say that sovereignty resides in the Constitution, that our public officials swear an oath to the Constitution when they take office, not necessarily the nation, which is really kind of vague. And if you take that uh, too far, it uh, kind of leaves room for some of the heads to be rolling later on and that sort of thing. Four, liberty consists in the power to do anything that does not injure others. Accordingly, the exercise of the rights of each man has no limits except those that secure the enjoyment of these same rights to the other members of society. These limits can be determined only by law. 
5. The law has only the rights to forbid such actions that are injurious to society. And here we see Jeffersonian classical liberalism, that the function of government is only to keep me from hurting someone else, that if I'm doing anything that does not hurt someone else, then that is none of the government's business, that the government can only step in if someone is doing something harmful to someone else. That is the principle of classical liberalism, that generally when it comes to politics, society, the economy, that government should stay out unless some legitimate harm is being done. Six, law is the expression of the general will. All citizens have the right to take part personally or by their representatives and its formation. It must be the same for all. Now you see Rousseau stepping in again here that law is an expression of the general will. And so far we've seen, all right, so the law can only step in when people are hurting each other or to keep you from hurting someone else that if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's none of your business. But then we see here that law is an expression of the general will, which when you take that into account, well, what if the general will is to say that uh, I shouldn't do something or something like that. Um, this is the language of democracy, which doesn't necessarily have any liberal values attached to it. So you can see that there are some contradictions in this document, that we have this dialogue between Jefferson and Rousseau, and they are not always saying the same things. And if we go on and we look here, we see some things that really sound a lot like the U.S. Bill of Rights, that uh, no one can be... Uh, accused, arrested, detained, except, uh, you know, determined by law, due process, and all of that kind of stuff, uh, that uh, people should be able to express their opinions. Now, when you look, though, more closely at number 10, we see here, no one should be disturbed on account of his opinions, even religious, which this sounds like the U.S. Bill of Rights. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, abridging the freedom of speech, all of that kind of stuff. But when you look closely here, it says, provided their manifestation does not upset the public order established by law, which leaves a little bit of room for interpretation, that you have a right to your free opinions, even in religion, as long as it is not subverting the public order. Whereas in the Bill of Rights, you see that you have a right to these things period, uh, and then to be able to assemble peaceably as long as you're not doing violence or something like that. But there's nothing there that says that, oh, well, you know, this your opinions violate the public order or something like that. So you see some room here for the role of government to increase beyond what uh, these people may have envisioned it increasing to and kind of foreshadowing the reign of terror in a few years. And I've got a few more in the document if you want to keep reading, but I think that you have gotten the gist of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which is really to articulate the values of the French Revolution, Jeffersonian liberalism, and, uh, you know, sort of a Rousseau, almost uh, democratic, maybe in some ways almost proto-socialist mentality coming in. So you're already seeing that the French Revolution has a little bit of an identity crisis. What are the values? values of the French Revolution, and this is going to really, in most cases, articulate the liberalism of the beginning of the French Revolution, but also to foreshadow the radicalization of the French Revolution, which is based on a simplistic reading of Rousseau. So hopefully you understand that a little bit better, and you can kind of understand where we're going, and as far as where we're going in this series, the next installment is on the civil constitution of the clergy, and that is all also very important because it is sort of a transition from the liberalism of the early French Revolution to the more collective proto-socialistic reign of terror that's going to come later so that I hope you will keep watching the series and I'll keep adding some things I'm hoping one day to have this series finished all the way through the Napoleonic Wars and uh, if you like what you heard if you're learning stuff you're getting ready for whatever exam or just learning for fun remember subscribe to my channel visit my website tomrichie.net Twitter Instagram Facebook like dislike comment let me know what you think and thank you so much for watching and we'll uh, be back soon Till next time.